Welcome to the Dakota Live podcast. I'm your host, Robert Morier. The goal of this podcast is to help you better know the people behind investment decisions. We introduce you to chief investment officers, manager research professionals, sales leaders, and other important players in the industry who will help you sell in between the lines and better understand the investment sales ecosystem. If you're not familiar with Dakota and their Dakota Live content, please check out dakota.com to learn more about their services. Uh, before we get started, I need to read a brief disclosure. This content is provided for informational purposes and should not be relied upon as recommendations or advice about investing in securities. All investments involve risk and may lose money. Uh, Dakota does not guarantee the accuracy of any of the information provided by the speaker who is not affiliated with Dakota, not a solicitation, testimonial, or an endorsement by Dakota or its affiliates. Nothing herein is intended to indicate approval, support, or a recommendation of the investment advisor or its supervised persons by Dakota. Today's episode is brought to you by Dakota Marketplace. Are you tired of constantly jumping between multiple databases and channels to find the right investment opportunities? Introducing Dakota Marketplace. Marketplace, the comprehensive institutional and intermediary database built by fundraisers for fundraisers. With Dakota Marketplace, you'll have access to all channels and asset classes in one place, saving you time and streamlining your fundraising process. Say goodbye to the frustration of searching through multiple databases and say hello to a seamless and efficient fundraising experience. Sign up now and see the difference Dakota Marketplace can make for you. Visit dakotamarketplace.com today. And I am always happy to introduce you to my friend on the desk, Andrew Roche. Andrew, welcome back. Thanks. Excited to be here. And we're happy to have you here. And uh, having a great guest today. You know, Boston's obviously chock full of different types of allocators, you know, foundations, endowments, family offices, multifamily offices. And Winrose has always brought a very institutional approach to investing. So excited to hear um, more about the process and things along those lines. We thought it was only fair since uh, Philadelphia lost to Boston in the, uh, in, the, uh, in the playoffs that somebody from Boston would come to Philadelphia just to rub it in. Yep, yep. So thank you for being here to, uh, to let us know that we lost and that we're going to be restructuring over the next <laughs> several months. But it's wonderful to have you. Thank you. And Gildas, welcome to Philadelphia. Thank you. Thank you for having me here. Yeah. Thank you for being here. Um, well, before we, uh, before we uh, get into the conversation, we have a lot of questions for you. Uh, I'm going to just read your biography very quickly and let the audience know uh, who you are, and, and then we'll, we'll get into it. Gilda Kenkis is the Chief Investment Officer of Windrose Advisors. Gilda oversees investment strategy, asset allocation, and manager selection for the firm. He is a member of the Windrose Advisors Investment Committee. Uh, Boston-based Windrose Advisors is an independent boutique wealth management firm uh, that delivers sophisticated, customized investment advice to a select group of families, foundations, and endowments. Uh, founded in 2009 by Boston-area entrepreneurs, and experienced institutional investment professionals. The firm has grown to $3.6 billion in assets under advisement as of December 31st, 2022, with 23 employees and a dedicated team of seven investment professionals. Uh, previously, Gilda served as the Deputy Chief Investment Officer at Partners Healthcare System, uh, now called Mass General Brigham, uh, a Boston hospital group including leading academic medical centers affiliated with Harvard Medical School. Uh, over the course of his tenure with the investment office, assets under management, including operational endowment and pension assets, grew from $3 billion to over $13 billion. And his prior responsibilities expanded from analyst to portfolio manager and director of public markets. In his various roles, Gilda managed a money market portfolio of up to $1 billion, evaluated and selected managers across all asset classes, including public and private alternatives, and participated in the investment committee of Partners Healthcare. Uh, prior to joining the investment office, Gilda worked across the system as an analyst with Treasury, Financial Planning, and Partners Healthcare International. Gilda earned his MBA from Northeastern University and his BA from Neoma Business School in France. He was honored in 2014 with a Rising Star Award by Investor Intelligence Network and has been a guest lecturer at Boston College. He currently serves on the investment committee of the Longwood Collective, a nonprofit organization that provides indispensable programs and services in Boston's Longwood medical and academic area. Uh, currently, Gilda sits on the advisory committee of Edison Partners, and Gilda is also a CFA and CAIA charter holder. Gilda and his wife reside in Beverly, Massachusetts, with their two sons, and 
Shilda, again, welcome to Philadelphia. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Rob. Great to be here. A longer biography than you expect? Uh, a little bit. Uh, <laughs> it takes one of those events to realize, you know, how long you've been working. <laughs> uh, yeah, it, it's um, it, it's always, I think, uh, to most of our guests who join us, they'll usually stop and say, okay, I, I didn't realize how much I've done or how long I've been at this. Usually it's the gray hair that shows them, but when there's actually red to them, it's a, diff <laughs> it's a different story. <laughs> You know, on the podcast, what we usually do is we start with the beginning uh, because you have had a very long and successful career, and we, we sincerely congratulate you on all your success. So we're, we're grateful for you to be here. Um, but you know, coming from France, uh, you studied at, at Northeastern, as we mentioned before, uh, and then of course undergraduate in France before that. So, so how does a student studying accounting and, fin and finance in northern France uh, find themselves as a financial analyst with a, a Boston-based healthcare company? Go back to the origin story. <laughs> Um, well, I think the, the, the coming to America is the easy part. Um, studying in France at my business school, um, I was fortunate enough that they had an established exchange program with Northeastern, uh, where I had the opportunity to come to the U.S. and complete a dual degree. Um, so getting both my degree in France and the MBA from, um, from Northeastern. So coming here was the easy part. Um, I ended up loving my um, studies at Northeastern, discovering a real, you know, depth um, of uh, academics, uh, loving the Boston area, wanting to stay there longer, experience more um, of the American culture. And I got engaged along the way and sort of my plans changed. Um, and, you know, something that was meant to be uh, a temporary experience became, you know, a long term commitment. Yeah, it's uh, always interesting. Sometimes the personal can take us into our professional. So uh, it makes a lot of sense. So we appreciate you sharing that. So y as you're in the United States, you've decided to come here. Now you're going to be staying. How did you think about your career path as you're, you know, you're about to graduate and, and you spent a long time at Partners. So, so I ask that in the context of 21 years at the same firm. Yes. Um, maybe that is unique to me. Um, so... My father worked in the hospital industry, managing a hospital in France. My grandfather, prior to that, um, managed um, a retirement home. And so I felt sort of this natural affinity to the industry. And, you know, back in 1994, when I graduated, the economy was not so strong. So I was not getting a whole lot of feedback from the investment industry while I was trying to break in. Um, but then I started sending my resume to hospitals and they were kind enough at Brigham and Women's Hospital at the time to bring me in first as an intern, subsequently as a management trainee. Um, and, you know, I stayed there out of loyalty because the job kept becoming more and more interesting. It was uh, an interesting time in industry too. Uh, I joined just prior to the merger of Brigham and Women's with Mass General Hospital, where they formed Partners Healthcare System at the time. Um, so you had this whole healthcare industry in abolition um, trying to, you know, uh, wrest more efficiencies uh, from the system. Uh, they were really trying to launch their investment program, um, which at the time was very conservative, mostly focused on fixed income. Um, but they had fantastic advisors on the board. You, you mentioned the ties to Harvard Medical School. So we had a lot of connections to uh, high profile investment managers in the Boston area. Um, the dean of uh, Harvard Business School was the chair of our investment committee uh, for the longest time. And all those very interesting connections that really morphed over the years into a full-fledged investment office. So as that investment office came together, I, I, there, there could be pros and cons to having that type of board. Uh, sometimes that board can have a lot of influence in terms of the decisions that are made uh, from the day-to-day -day operations all the way through to the manager selection. So how did you see that relationship with the advisory board develop and grow over time, particularly as you were developing and growing uh, in, in the role? It was a great training ground for me um, because initially the investment committee supported by the consultant would drive the asset allocation and the manager selection. So for years, they would interview the managers themselves. And it was in the later years where they increasingly passed the baton to the investment team to come up with new ideas and eventually make the um, investment recommendations and become fully independent. You have to you know, put yourself back in the context of hospitals where this was an embryonic investment office really nested within a treasury operation, a, a larger finance organization, but it was now the main focus of the institution. 
So it took years to develop and morph into a, a professional investment office, mm -hmm. building staff from, I think we were three analysts at the beginning to a team of more than 20 um, by the time we left. Well, going from three billion to thirteen billion is significant. How much of that was consolidation that was going on, you know, in the system itself, uh, you know, versus just doing new things? Obviously, increasing uh, assets through successful performance and manager selection. So, you know, if you think about that growth over those years, that's quite a significant amount of assets, and you know, to 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 develop with. Of course, the system continued to make a couple of acquisitions. Other hospital systems joined the Partners Healthcare Group. But by and large, they were not very significant pools of assets. Um, the main source of the assets came from the Mass General Hospital, which was the oldest institution that had created an endowment, you know, going back 1811, I believe, and really um, grew that into a significant asset base of the years. Um, so most of the growth came from successful investment performance. Um, and then along the way, um, a little bit of fundraising, um, you know, certainly donations to the system continued. Um, the hospital was in a strong financial position with a double A plus credit rating, able to issue debt that would help sustain the pension plan. So that was also a factor. Well, as, uh, as much as I admire you being at one firm for 21 years, I also admire people who decide to leave as it's a long time to be at one uh, organization and then to move to a new place to start new. Andrew, I know in your role, you deal with transitions all the mm -hmm. time, people moving from role to role. Uh, but after 21 years, that's a, that's a, you know, it's a, it's a big jump. So what prompted it? Um, how did you decide to make the move? What was it about Windrose that was appealing? Maybe one of the, most difficult decisions of my life. Uh, after 20 plus years at Partners Healthcare, it was still going strong. You know, I had a tremendous um, experience there working with great people. Um, but at the same time, 20 years is a long time. If I was going to try something different, it felt like the right moment to think of something new. Um, I happened to know um, Bill Hyten was the founder of Winrose um, from his previous time at MIT. Um, and he reached out to me as they were looking to grow the firm. Um, so it suddenly presented a path to becoming eventually chief investment officer, getting an equity ownership into a smaller entrepreneurial firm, um, all in the Boston area. Um, so it, it became a compelling opportunity. Um, and of course, you know, moving from an endowment to family office, smaller, fewer resources, presented plenty of challenges, but plenty of opportunities as well. Did you have to change your mindset, that entrepreneurial mindset to, to start to realize that- Absolutely. You had to change the paper and the printer and the, the things were different all of a sudden. <laughs> you have to learn to wear many hats. Yes. Well, one thing I never had to worry about uh, at Partner Healthcare was suddenly interacting with clients mm -hmm. and being a little more involved in, a, in the pitching process with prospects. And so that was a completely new aspect. How about the transition from working with an institution to taxable, you know, ultra high net worth investors? How did that, what did you bring from partners from that experience investing that applied? And what did you have to learn new perhaps in your philosophy? Yeah, those are great questions. I think what was very translatable from my experience at Partner Healthcare to Winrose is the fact that Winrose is very exclusively focused on the ultra high net worth segment. Mm -hmm. So those are all significant wealth owners, um, all qualified investors, able to participate in alternatives. In fact, coming to Winrose to participate in alternatives, whether private equity or hedge funds. Mm -hmm. uh, so all the skills I had developed at, at Partners readily apply to the same clientele. Um, those were all long-term investors typically not looking to spend their whole wealth, but pass it on to the next generation or maybe pass it on to a foundation and philanthropic activities. Um, so that allowed us to adopt a similar mindset of patient investing, mm -hmm. investing for the long term, um, looking for active managers, but unlocking value over the, those longer investment horizons. Mm -hmm. um, so a very similar approach to what we we're doing before. What was different um, to your point is the fact that now we had to deal with taxes. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a tremendous friction that uh, nonprofits don't have to deal with, um, losing up to 40% you know, of a return stream to taxes. And so certainly there are a number of strategies that I had to learn, such as tax location, taking advantage of the various estate planning structures put in place for the clients, 
um, least tax efficient assets in the most uh, advantageous tax locations, um, but also considering um, strategies for managers and the returns they could offer in the light of after-tax returns, mm -hmm. you know, and how much is truly available to the clients after taking taxes into consideration. Mm -hmm. Certainly affects your mindset. Um, you know, it, the types of managers that you're looking for. One is you're looking for managers with a higher return expectation because mm -hmm. you're trying to offset that friction a little bit. You're also looking for managers that will have an inherently more tax efficient investment approach, which gets back to long-term investing, lower turnover to maximize the long-term capital gains. Um, or you're, you're learning that because you're taking all that risk with individual strategies, potentially moving more and more into more concentrated strategies, you need to build a very diversified portfolio to mitigate the risk that you're taking in order to achieve that higher return potential. Mm -hmm. To that point, did you all create, you, you have QP investors, but you know, to get that diversification across vintages and managers and sub-styles, did you all still create an in internal vehicle to access alternatives where they could get one K1 from Winrose versus multiple managers? How did that work? Yeah, that's, that is indeed the approach um, um, we implemented at, at Winrose. It's really uh, a concept I borrowed from my experience at Partners Healthcare, where all the assets were managed into various pools. Mm -hmm. They were organized by uh, investment horizon at the time, but same idea, it was a very efficient um, way to invest where the various components of the healthcare system could buy units into various pools based mm -hmm. on um, their asset base and, and investment horizon. Um, and then the investment office would take care of all the investing on the behalf. So we applied the same concept at Winrose. Uh, it, it's something I helped put in place after I joined the firm and we organized various investment pools. There with a slightly different objective, it was more looking to build asset allocation building blocks. Mm -hmm. So talking to a client, um, a lot of the discussion revolves around how much risk are you willing to take? What returns are you hoping to accomplish? How much illiquidity mm -hmm. or how much um, drawdown can you tolerate in your portfolio? Those are all important asset allocation decisions that tell you how much to invest maybe in long equities, in hedge funds, in private equity. But once that decision is made, it's really more efficient for an investment team to implement it and put it into practice. So we created those various investment pools, each with a different investment objective in mind, really looking to have all the constituents of a diversified portfolio allocation on behalf of clients. And so to your point, there are a number of benefits of creating that structure. Um, clients can buy units into a pool. They instantly get access to a diversified portfolio of assets that's already in place. It doesn't matter if a manager is close to new uh, money or not. It's already part right. of the pool. So everybody gets to benefit. There's, there are no issues for clients of uh, meeting the minimums mm -hmm. to participate in the individual managers because it's already achieved by the pool. And then we simplify the investment experience for the clients. Mm -hmm. There's one K1 mm -hmm. from a tax standpoint, but it's also all the rebalancing that takes place during the year. There's no need to send a notice to clients for every single money movement. Mm -hmm. It's all handled in a very um, centralized fashion. Mm -hmm. So how is the investment team structured? So uh, you, as you, you know, came to educate yourself on the challenges a, a taxable portfolio presents, um, how did you address what was necessary from your client's perspective uh, as it relates to your team and the resources that you wanted to build around you? Initially, we, we had a very senior team, or, um, or always have, and considering that we're, we're looking to cover a lot of um, asset classes and what we bring into the mix, I mean, starting with me, or, you know, to your point, over 20 plus years experience in, in, the, in the field, a lot of networks, a lot of connections built with managers over the years, um, but I can't cover everything. I have my own biases, and so I need in interlapping networks from different members of the team. Um, so I was lucky enough um, to attract um, my former colleague uh, from Partners Healthcare who worked on the private equity portfolio there. So she brings a wealth of networks and connections um, to the mix when it comes to investing in private equity. Um, we found some um, extraordinary people in the, in the hedge fund field that came out of the fund of fund uh, industry, uh, very focused on um, you know, all the managers in that space. And again, a wealth of connections. 
And then we were lucky enough to have a couple of rising stars among our ranks, you know, people that, that grew, most of them that were able to, to retain. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, obviously, uh, always a little bit of um, turnover. Um, but the team ends up being structured around, I would say, today, three senior investment professionals with different specialties mm -hmm. around hedge funds and private equity, backed by another three more junior people. Mm -hmm on the team that, you know, help us um, accomplish all the legwork. Since you said it, what are those biases that you have? So as you were thinking about what you tend to gravitate towards uh, as uh, as a CIO, the asset classes or the characteristics of a manager that, you know, you tend to that tend to resonate with you. What are some of those biases that you maintain and, and what were you looking to, I guess, in a sense, diversify away from when you were building the team? So um, maybe it's because I'm French. Maybe I, I had, um, you know, a quantitative background. I focused on math and physics in high school. Um, but I've always had the mindset uh, that quantitative strategies were very interesting. A lot of diversifying characteristics. Um, you know, it led to some thinking around factor analysis and really what drives investment performance. So that shapes a lot of my own thinking during manager selection. Um, but realizing that quantitative strategies are not very tax efficient, you know, you can't make a whole portfolio out of them. Um, and, you know, I've always had a, my own personal bias growing from fixed income to public market type strategies. So not as developed on the private market side of things. So definitely I had to bring someone with a lot of heft on the private market side to make sure we had the strongest portfolio possible. Um, it's definitely one of the lessons as a leader is to realize you can't do everything by yourself and you want to surround yourself by the brightest, smartest people you can possibly get. Um, so definitely that aspect. That's why Andrew is on the desk with me, by the way. <laughs> if I tried to do this by myself, uh, my, my, my biases would, would come out, which are that I need help. So I'm glad that Andrew's here to, to be able to support it. Right. <laughs> That's, it's good advice. I mean, I, I think particularly as you're increasing your team and the depth of your team, you know, looking at those long-term, you know, strategic objectives of your clients. But if you take a step back uh, in terms of, you know, what you refer to a few times as it relates to the asset allocation process. So how does that idea generation work with your team now that you've you know you've filled out the roles that you think are necessary you have a combination of very senior as well as the rising star so when you when you think about that idea generation process and that asset allocation mix how are those decisions derived there are two components one is you know the, the top down sort of views on the market which really factor into client discussions and where we think maybe they should tilt the portfolio lean into maybe areas that are a little more opportunistic given current market conditions. But that only affects the flows of money into the various pools. The manager selection decisions remains first and foremost the bottom-up selection process, and it's driven by ideas from the entire team. Uh, I mentioned the interlapping network. You know, We have met different groups of managers over the years. We bring different ideas to the table. Uh, connections oftentimes will say something like, you know, this sector is starting to look interesting. Valuations are declining. It looks like maybe some catalysts will turn things around. And who do we know? And, you know, that's when the discussion around the table comes in. And we have people who can draw upon to get some ideas. We have personal connections to maybe managers in the space that we you know, can connect with and start the discussion, start the research process. Mm. So it's usually this very organic uh, discussion. We're a very flat organization. Everybody sort of sits in cubicles, very close to each other with constant conversation when we're not disrupted by the whole pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, but that's meant to foster, you know, a, a lot of interactions and, 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 and the flow of ideas. So, for example, if you're working in an inflationary environment right now, when you think about asset classes like private real estate, real assets, uh, natural resources, are, are the, would those come, in, come up then during that conversation and then you'll then tap into your manager network? Or uh, will you keep a stable of managers kind of in the background that you can call on at any time? It's not so much um, a stable of managers you can call up at any time. I think you, you, you tend to be too late and too reactive. Um, so instead, you know, we try to skate where the puck is going. We try to be a step ahead of the market. When it comes to real assets in particular, we started building 
our, our liquid real asset portfolio in 2017 when this um, sector was completely out of favor. But the reason we did that is we figured it would take us years to get to know the managers, to really make uh, enough selection to build a diversified portfolio, and we wanted to be ready for when the winds would shift. Um, so some decisions were relatively easy, going to people we knew, looking at um, valuations. And some, you know, it's easier to participate, let's say, with ETFs or very um, transparent public market strategies. Um, if the markets are conducive, those are easier decisions because you can always pull back from a mistake, mm -hmm. right? They remain liquid. Um, and then over time, pushing more and more toward the hedge funds and you know, considering private strategies where you make longer and longer term commitments. Um, but what we discovered along the way was um, actually very exciting because um, the downturn in the market, you know, the long decade of underperformance in, um, in that sector had almost destroyed the investment community. Funds were closing left and right, and you had a couple of survivors. And then you had a couple of you know, gray beards that were trying something new, launching a new effort to take advantage of changing market conditions. Um, so it was both being connected to the survivors and then knowing enough about the previous firms and the pedigrees and you know the origin story of all the other funds to sort of select which were the more um, the more interesting ones. But you know our conclusion was there was going to be a very limited pool of talent available. Um, you know, in particular when it came to commodity trading, natural resources investing, because no one training at investment banks was going to those fields. Mm -hmm. And so, so the natural training ground was not happening. So there would be this whole generation missing that would naturally evolve into uh, asset managers. And so you had to really go back to people with experience. Um, and most of those strategies would, by their own nature, you know, markets are very concentrated, maybe less liquid, harder to trade. So they're all capacity constrained. So we wanted to be first with our foot in the door, even if it was just a tall position that we could expand later on, even if you know it was hard to gather assets. Um, but we convinced our clients, you wanted to prepare for the possibility of inflation, um, even if it seemed remote at the time. Um, and so we started assembling that portfolio and you know it's evolved into some a pool, I think it's 12 managers within uh, real assets. Um, you know, covering commodities, natural resources, infrastructure, and then liquid real estate. Um, so we built it early. Um, it was a long, hard slog for maybe three years, and then everything changed after the pandemic. And you know that that pool um, started catching up to the rest of the market. <laughs> um, so I think after five years, um, you know, from 2017 through 2022, our real assets pool had finally caught up to the broader equity market, which went the other path, shoot up like, shot up like a rocket and then came down hard in 2022. And it was kind of the other pattern with our real assets portfolio that uh, really, really caught up to it. Um, so getting back to you know the idea of building very diversified portfolios, uh, I think that was Really a prime example. There's something to be said about first mover advantage. So getting into certain areas of the market or certain asset managers before the market the market realizes the you know the value that's there. Um, you had mentioned convincing your clients to to engage with those managers or at least in that investment idea early. Will you also engage with peers? Will you work with other allocators? You know to potentially coordinate an early investment with one of these asset managers. We're always very engaged with our allocator peers. Um, be they endowments or family offices. Um, but that's when you started to realize sort of the shifting sands in the industry, uh, the development of um, ESG and rising concerns with the environment um, that led um, many endowments to shy away from investing in the natural resources sector mm -hmm. and changing the dynamics um, uh, around what was happening there. Um, so. Most of our conversations with them would be, yes, we know who they are. It sounds interesting, but we're not going to participate. I think early on, the whole industry you know, shifted to 
private markets to avoid the volatility in, in the public side of things, and then eventually gave up on it altogether, uh, which is a more recent development. Um, family offices, on the other hand, were much more willing to pursue that approach, understanding the potential value that lied in it. And I would say um, foreign investors were much more interested than US investors, mm -hmm. which was always an interesting dynamic. Um, European investors, very familiar with commodities trading, much more willing to embrace that mm -hmm. style of um, investing, which is not very commonly found within um, uh, endowment allocations. Hmm. Talking about manager selection, <clears throat> you know, a big part of manager selection, right, is identifying an edge that that manager has and then understanding why that's repeatable going forward. Because at the end of the day, you're investing in a manager's future decision making. Mm -hmm. How do you all go about the diligence process? Obviously, there's performance and where it fits in the portfolio that you can assess, but thinking about the qualitative assessments of what makes a firm unique, what is the process like you all employ to help identify those types of characteristics? I don't think there's one simple answer to this. Um, so yes, you, you try to find some comfort from the analysis of historical returns. Sometimes it's available, sometimes it's not, and you still want to make a decision. So a lot of the ultimate decision will rely on the qualitative assessment. How smart do we think you know, the approach is? How risky is it? And you know, is it the right mix, the right balance? If it's risky, can we diversify it away within the context of our portfolio? You know, so it gets back to as long as the manager has a demonstrable edge, there might be a way that it could work within the confines of a broader portfolio. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a lot of interviewing the managers, understanding the structure is stable. If what they're doing today follows a similar process mm -hmm. as in years past, whether at the current firm or maybe at previous firms. And then a lot of um, uh, reference checking, mm -hmm. um, trying to find out who they worked with in the past, um, what other allocators pursue those managers and what their experience was. Did they reach the same conclusions that we did? Um, what did we miss? So there's a lot of fact checking mm -hmm. that is involved all along that process. One of the attributes that I had read that you look for is a diversified mix of long-term concentrated strategies. So how do you define concentration? We, we hear a lot of different you know, variables in how concentrated a manager is, particularly in public equities. And it, it seems like the, you know, the more concentrated, the better. These days, it's, it's not just these days, it's been now a trend for several years. But what does concentration mean to, to you and the staff at Windrose? So talking about concentration, I'll, uh, first I'll, I'll talk about equity strategies because it's a little easier to grasp, but uh, the magic number is 20. Um, whether 20, you know, because it's the right uh, number of stocks that's needed to re um, the maximum diversification benefit uh, from a portfolio. Or on the flip side, you know, when it comes to investing and finding good ideas, um, there are studies that would say that beyond 20, you're moving into second best. And in fact, uh, to some extent, uh, areas where managers tend to destroy value. Uh, so really focusing on the top 20 ideas usually yields the best results. So uh, you talked about manager selection. One of the criteria we try and, try and assess whether the top holdings in a portfolio have indeed been the largest contributors to performance. Mm -hmm. And you know, is that intuition, is that um, uh, you know, research um, outcome uh, demonstrated in the manager's portfolio. So that would be one, one of the, the, the factors we might want to look at. That highly concentrated portfolio has led a lot of managers to say, yes, you're investing in 20 stocks. However, there are one, and two, one or two names that we're very excited about. So would you be interested in doing a co-invest? So both public and private markets, as you know well. So where do co-investments and with private markets, the, you know, the secondary market, where does that reside in your, in your asset allocation you know, discussions and investment decisions? So we do pursue co-investments. Um, we pursue them exclusively with investment partners that have already been selected for our platform. Um, and then they will tend to reside in the natural pool, trying to match the liquidity uh, of the pool. Um, so most co-investments uh, 
stem out of private equity firms. And they would naturally belong in a private equity pool alongside the managers. They're typically smaller in size, and we try to collect a few of them uh, to build some diversification. We reserved up to 20% um, of the commitment capacity of our private equity pools for co-investments. It's been a positive experience. And so we're applying that as well across private real estate, private credit. Um, so deploying the potential of co-investments, but always under the same guise of partnering with managers that have proven themselves that are already on our platform. Um, we get a lot of call calls of investors mm -hmm. suggesting co-investments, but those are not going to be um, approved and make it into our platform. Yeah, understandably. I would assume though you do get a number of calls from you know what we talk about often here at Dakota are emerging managers. So a managers that are maybe coming out of a, an existing shop, starting their own business for the first time, analysts that are graduating to a portfolio manager, starting their own shop, but you know, generally, you know, lesser, smaller asset base, smaller assets under management, shorter track records. W where do emerging managers sit in, you know, in your ecosystem, if at all? Um, and I'm always curious if there are different ways to approach emerging managers, for example, if you would, uh, uh, either invest in the emerging manager, take an equity stake, potentially revenue share. So if you could elaborate, it would be, I think, helpful for us and, and our audience to understand your emerging manager approach. So we've always looked at emerging managers as part of our manager selection process. Um, really our portfolios, I would say our balance mix. We have some very established funds and we have a slew of newer, you know, emerging managers that, you know, might be less, lesser known. Um, I think it goes back to the idea of a life cycle of hedge funds, but that applies to most funds. Investment firms are not necessarily meant to last in perpetuity. A lot of things change. You need kind of perfect chemistry um, for this um, structure to work. Um, but certainly there are some characteristics of early uh, stage firms, whether it's the motivation to succeed or it's the fact that they are not yet encumbered by a large asset base that gives them flexibility to, in, to invest in the most interesting areas based on the process um, and have the potential to show their successful track records early in their career. Um, so a perfect match for us is um, a fund that might be one or two years into its launch they have grown a little bit, but they haven't really exceeded a very large asset base, say 300 to 500 million. They're a little small for large allocators to really work with them. Um, they look promising, interesting process in pedigree. It's kind of the right, again, chemistry. They, the team is composed of people who work together. They own their firm. Um, so you sort of start to see, you know, the right collection of ingredients. Um, to the point where we want to participate. So, you know, I, for, for Windrose, even though we're 4 billion in assets, you know, it's significant, but it's not huge. And for us, we're able to participate with those emerging managers with very few constraints. Um, if a manager only has 300 million in assets and we want to provide a ticket, you know, five to 10 million typically, mm -hmm. we're not going to overwhelm the fund's capacity or be a significant investor. But we can be a meaningful contributor. We can provide a lot of advice along the way. Um, it creates a tremendous partnership between us and the firm early on where they are extremely thankful. It provides us access to the lead PM um, for an extended period of time. Maybe we get the first call when the fund closes and then chooses to reopen who is going to get that new capital. Uh, so it provides a lot of optionality um, to, to Winrose as well as, you know, Oftentimes, the opportunity to participate in a founder share class, which gives us mm -hmm. another way to lower the fees and expenses of, on behalf of our clients. Um, so we're really, we love to participate with those managers when they're just about to embark on their wealth creation phase. You know, maybe they worked out the kinks, setting up the firm, mm -hmm. building a portfolio, they're ready to go. And, you know, this is a good time to engage. Um, I think naturally on the other end of the spectrum is, you know, dealing with firms that are maybe aging, experiencing change and how long to stay. That is always a very, very difficult decision. Um, much 
how did you take? Because oftentimes you've built long lasting relationships um, with those people. Yeah, absolutely. You actually published a paper called The Life Cycle of Hedge Funds. You, you touch on the fact that hedge funds have expiration dates uh, and no hedge fund can exist in perpetuity. I thought that was a very interesting article or white paper. So can you elaborate on what are the signs that you see then when a manager is approaching the end of their shelf life? And uh, and what attri- what attributes distinguish hedge fund managers in the in the earlier fresher days of their of their life cycle versus as you said the the end of I I don't want to say the end of days it sounds so <laughs> <laughs> but but towards the end I think the, the first criteria is really it has to be asset size it just leads eventually to some impediments to the investment process or maybe some bad habits or new developments that are you know not helpful. To, uh, to performance. The obvious constraint for, of a large asset base is, you know, you don't want to create an asset liability mismatch. So it will eventually push the managers toward larger caps, more liquid opportunities, um, and maybe abandon some of the promising smaller, less liquid opportunities that were a hallmark of their success early on. And so the nature of the investment performance starts to change. Um, you know, so that becomes an impediment. Um, with assets comes new revenue, sort of either the loss of motivation from making so much money from just management fees, or the desire to prove to investors they can do something else and maybe branch out into new areas, launch a new product, um, a private side pocket, um, mm-hmm. you know, expand the size of the team, or creating their own sets of headaches whether they be fundraising distractions for the new products or maybe dealing with managing a larger and larger team of analysts. Um, It's sort of the risk that, you know, this dilutes the intellectual capital at the firm where they have to worry more about compensating analysts and giving them something interesting to work on as opposed to having this cohesive, relatively small knit group of managers working for performance. Mm -hmm. There's definitely a limit as to the number of managers, um, of analysts that a manager can supervise Mm -hmm. from discussions five or six seems to be the optimal Mm -hmm. size. And beyond that, you know, you start creating layers Mm -hmm. in the organizations where ideas have to make their way to the top one step after the other and create, again, more frictions into into the investment process. So asset size is definitely a red flag for us. We try to talk to the managers um, in our portfolios about the opportunity set, you know, based on the market, what their strategy is, what they attend, intend to pursue um, versus how much they have raised already. And, you know, talking about capacity limits mm-hmm. and, you know, when are you going to close the fund is always a recurrent question. A particularly dangerous time is a, a surge in assets, sometimes because of windfall returns in a market. And what are you doing with that? Are you going to return capital, keep the fund size small, or are you going to keep it? And then what? Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, so that, that would be something that raises a lot of questions. I think the natural step when that happens is to trim your allocation for risk management reasons and just to see what happens with the, the process. Um, but usually, that's a red flag that should lead to a lot of discussions. Um, and then, you know, of course, there's the the lack of motivation that happens with the aging, maybe new pursuits, whether they be philanthropic or personal. Um, you know, the the fact that they would be less motivated um, by the pursuit of a, a carry incentive as opposed to just collecting the management fee and what that might do to the organization and, and their investment process, maybe a stronger focus on risk management and preventing drawdowns, which may have the effect of curtailing upside. Mm-hmm. Um, so in a nutshell, adopting a more conservative approach to preserve the capital and keep that return stream for as long as possible, which may not be what early investors would have underwritten. Um, so those are all factors that may lead to a difficult decisions. You know, it's time to move on and find one of those younger, hungrier managers. So, you know, sort of restarting, priming the pump again, mm-hmm. you know, as managers um, evolve. The good news is that when you partner with managers early, they have a long runway 
before you really have to worry about it. I think, you know, especially in the early years, they're much more worried about raising capital and building a good track record for the next five years. I would agree. I, I've had a few interviews with asset managers over the years, and I remember one of them well. It was with a hedge fund manager, and I asked him what motivates him. Uh, and he said that he can't afford the art that he wants. So it was, it was really just about upgrading his collection at his house. And I, I sat on that, and I thought it was interesting it's it's certainly a motivator you know but is it really what you know what what gets you going in the morning i think that's one of the reasons emerging manager programs have you know have really started to um to burgeon in the industry is because you do have asset managers with skin in the game you know they have their own money in the fund uh you know every dollar lost is a dollar that they'll feel but every dollar they gain is is a motivation you know to to do more and they have the ability to build their own culture and their own business around it so uh, all of that makes a lot of sense. Well, I know Andrew likes to ask this question, so I'm going to front run him. But one of the questions we love to ask is we have a good sense of the types of managers that you look for. We have a good sense of generally how to approach you, but what are you looking for today? So what are the asset classes or, you know, the ideas that are, um, you know, that you are all spending a lot of time around as it relates to, you know, who should be calling you rather than how we should call you? So we're always looking across a number of dimensions. Uh, I think what has changed, or however, in, in the past year is the fact that interest rates have increased and it's changing a couple of dynamics. Um, you have strategies that used to short a lot, abandon the practice uh, during a time period where interest rates were very compressed, leading to you know, low dispersion, less successful shorting. Um, there was no short rebate to earn. And now that environment is changing. So um, a fund with a lot of shorting on the book is going to earn 5% mm -hmm. on that cash. is suddenly providing a tailwind. Maybe that's sufficient to help offset the fees. Um, and that was not the case before. In addition, you know, there's definitely data showing that there's strong correlation between higher interest rates and higher dispersion, which tends to benefit long short strategies. Um, so long short, you know, after going through the desert, maybe for 10, 15 years, being pointed at as an area with declining alpha, uh, in my opinion, a lot of it uh, had to do with the macroeconomic environment and just the compressed interest rates. And this is likely to change. Um, so a greater emphasis on long short strategies, but I would say not the, the types of managers that um, like to invest in privates and do also a crossover, really the emphasis should be on the traditional long short that used to implement a lot of shorting um, and maybe you know slightly higher uh, gross exposure overall. So those long short managers can stop talking about their long only portfolios now? Yeah, and finally. <laughs> yeah, sure, sure. I think I just heard uh, fees across the industry go up as a result of those <laughs> comments. Well, now they'll have to prove that they can short effectively. Um, but I think uh, that, that is a very promising area. The other um, area that is maybe uh, overlooked, uh, you know, going back to quantitative strategies is all funds that rely on derivatives. Mm -hmm. And typically those are financed, you know, with some collateral, but you only put up say 20% as collateral and 80% of the portfolio really sits as cash. Um, and that cash earns 5%. So again, you know, strategies like global macro, trend following, uh, commodity traders um, that buy futures. Um, I think those are all strategies that are suddenly benefiting from this tailwind from higher interest rates. You mentioned high dispersion for long short manager there's been a lot of talk now about the concentration in the public markets indices. Do you think that dispersion also favors maybe a concentrated long only manager that's much different than the index going forward? I think it's to a point, differentiating from the index. Mm -hmm. um, so this concentration within the index has been very worrisome because it's sort of the larger caps that drive the index and they're the most expensive stocks. And the reason they've been expensive is, yes, they're high quality, great companies, you know, and they've proven to be safe havens in the past. But is that going to persist mm -hmm. if you have this valuation overhang that could reverse? Um, so trying to lean away from the benchmark seems like a good idea mm -hmm. uh, prospectively. It's that, that's where 
you know, it, it introduces carry risk mm -hmm. a little bit and the, the prospect of underperforming for a period of time. But that's where we rely on our history. You know, my story, my story about real assets and underperforming for three years before catching up to, mm -hmm. to the markets, I think it's probably similar in equities. You, know, you need to be willing to stomach a little bit of underperformance if you have the conviction that it's the right way to build investment returns for the long term. Well, uh, as we're getting close to the top of the hour, uh, I always like to ask our, particularly our CIOs, um, you know, it's, it's been a very challenging 18 months. It's really been a challenging four years, kind of beginning in the pandemic and then through. And we're, we're now in May, not to date the, uh, the episode specifically, because sometimes these airs a few, these air a few weeks after. Um, but the quote that I've been asking a lot of our guests is, or sharing with a lot of our guests is there are years that ask questions and there are years that answer. So as you think about where the year has gone, gone to date and where we may go for the rest of the year, do you think we're going to end this year with more questions or do you think we're actually going to get some answers, whether it's, you know, from interest rates, the Fed or, um, you know, geopolitics? I'm always curious just to kind of hear more of your, your predictions. There's no shortage of questions right now that, that, that go unanswered. Uh, the big one looming, you know, the, the market is pricing or is betting that the Fed will cut interest rates by the end of the year. And, you know, I think we'll, we'll know by the end of the year, we'll get that answer. And it probably will have some momentous consequences. Um, it's usually not a good idea to fight the Fed. Um, maybe the market is right this one time. Maybe this time is different. It seems like a dangerous <laughs> thing to say. <laughs> um, if There's just a high potential for markets to be disappointed. Um, and what would happen to this, you know, narrowly led equity market if that was the case? What would happen to interest rates if inflation is stickier? The Fed decides they really want to fight inflation. They're not going to cut rates this year. Maybe it's late next year. Um, what would this shift in the calendar, you know, full 12 months? What would, how would that impact valuations today? Mm -hmm. So I'm sure we'll get answers by the end of this year. I think what will change by the end of this year is very likely we'll be in a recessionary environment by then. Um, the banking crisis that just happened in March is only going to accelerate that movement. You have seen lenders pulling back on lending, uh, tighter your lending standards, um, more firms looking for rescue financing. Um, so all the elements are there. The question is how much of a credit crunch is it going to be? How pervasive? There are a couple of areas of pain that are obvious, such as commercial real estate. Um, but how much is that going to pervade, say, the direct lending, you know, the private credit industry, all those firms that have raised capital um, in the past couple of years? Um, most of them private equity sponsored. Um, so it's this interaction between the two uh, industries, private equity and, and private credit. Um, so we'll get, I think, a lot of answers uh, very soon. What are the questions your clients are asking? What to do now, as always. <laughs> um, I think, you know, the propensity of clients is to, uh, to your point, you know, realize the number of questions in the market, the high uncertainty, and remain frozen and maybe prefer the safety of treasuries to the prospect of long-term investing. Um, it's hard to disagree with them now that treasuries have risen to a more reasonable level, but I would argue that cash is still below inflation and it's not definitely not going to achieve their investment mm -hmm. objectives, their return objectives for the long-term. And opportunities to invest happen at times of uncertainty. Valuations are lower. Um, you need to position for the way market changes because once the market starts to change, it's too late to capture the full benefit. So I would argue that now is a good time to start positioning for what might develop over the next five, 10 years. The benefits of a long-term investment horizon. Yes. And I read a lot of investment commentaries and a lot of them say broadly the same thing, very conservative and their outlooks, but I've always enjoyed uh, Jill Dust's um, commentaries and letters, very thoughtful, in-depth, and he's been spot on. So thank you for joining. 
Thank you. We appreciate it. I do have one more question for you because you are approaching 30 years in the industry. And as Andrew had just mentioned, I, I think just myself personally, uh, I've been speaking with you for over a decade now, and you're one of the people who I've always enjoyed hearing from and getting a sense of what you're thinking. So I can take that out and make myself sound smarter than I really am. So I appreciate that insight. But I, I am just curious, as you think about you know yourself now, close to 30 years in, um, what's the type of advice you would give to people who are earlier in their careers? It is an uncertain environment. Uh, you've got two young sons. I have two young daughters. Andrew has a very young uh, baby as well. So as you think about advice going forward based on the experiences that you've taken yourself, uh, what would you share? Starting with advice my parents would have given me, which is always do the right thing, never lie, <laughs> and you know, adopt that attitude throughout your career. Um, it will only bring benefits. Um, but you know, beyond that, uh, you mentioned the high uncertainty. I think what it means is you need to cultivate uh, the characteristic of you know, having a curious mind, being willing to explore and ponder questions along the way. Um, not remain pigeonholed into one way of thinking or, you know, one, one way of investing. Um, so certainly uh, adopting this spirit of continuous learning, being willing to um, discover new things at all times, which uh, is very appropriate for our industry. I think we have, a, you know, as allocators, we have a lot of opportunities to speak with very smart managers that can point out the books we should read or, you know, the, uh, the thinking that is evolving, whether it's what's happening with uh, artificial intelligence or, you know, new, new trends. Um, so there's always something to learn. So definitely a uh, big piece of advice. Um, and, you know, I, I think show a spirit of initiative. Uh, you know, ideally, I would like everyone on the team to behave as a leader, um, show ownership in the work in the portfolio, in a firm, and demonstrate that by volunteering for projects, speaking up, doing team meetings, bringing new ideas, being openly curious. Um, you know, and I would say, you know, as a leader of an organization, developing that spirit, fostering that um, te teamwork um, is one of the most challenging aspects. It goes against human nature. Um, it forces you to get out there, maybe take a chance. Um, but those are the people that will eventually get promoted the fastest um, and, and reach interesting positions. That's great advice. It is. Thank you for being here. And congratulations on all your success. It's been a wonderful uh, hour. We've really enjoyed it. Andrew, as always, thank you for being here. If you want to learn more about Gilda and Windrose Advisors, please visit their website at www.windroseadvisor, that's with an O-R, dot com. You can find this episode and past episodes on Spotify, Apple, Google, or your favorite podcast platform. We are also available on YouTube if you prefer to watch while you listen. Uh, if you would like to catch up on past episodes, check out our website at dakota.com. Finally, if you like what you're seeing and hearing, please be sure to like, follow, and share these episodes. We welcome your feedback as well. Shilda, thank you for joining us today. Andrew, thank you for being here. And we hope to see you again soon. Don't say goodbye.